more than you know, almost 35 years ago now. Uh, I was I was a young lawyer and I was practicing uh, law, just a, a general practice. Bueno, un poquito más de 35 años atrás, yo era un abogado común y practicaba el derecho común. And someone handed me uh, a book by Peter Singer, the philosopher. Uh, I don't know why they did that, but they thought that I might be interested in reading it. Y alguien me entregó un libro, me dio un libro escrito por Peter Singer, que es un filósofo. No sé por qué razón me lo dieron, pensaron que yo podía estar interesado en el libro. And so I began to read it, and uh, it was really the first time I was ever confronted with how uh, we treated non-human animals. I, I had really never thought about it much before. Bueno, una vez que comencé a leerlo, ahí por primera vez me di cuenta de cómo tratamos a los animales no humanos. Yo nunca antes había tenido eso en cuenta. And I was unable to forget it, and I felt I either I I, I felt I then uh, had some kind of moral responsibility to use my legal training uh, to uh, try to help non-human animals because, after all, that's why I had become a lawyer in order to to uh, try to engage in, in social reform, and I couldn't see any any humans who needed me as much as non-human animals. Y bueno, de ahí en más nunca más lo olvidé y por eso es que empecé a usar el entrenamiento que yo tenía como abogado para luchar por estos animales no humanos que nadie lo hacía en ese momento y quién mejor que un abogado yo estudié para luchar contra la injusticia. And for a year I began to uh, to read about uh, non-human animals and began to think of what kind of cases I might be able to to take and Uh, I thought that I was the only lawyer in the world who cared at all about uh, using uh, his legal training to help non-human animals. Por un año eh, comencé a leer libros sobre bueno, el derecho animal y también para entender un poco y pensé que yo era el único abogado del mundo que estaba teniendo esto en cuenta, que estaba leyendo y preocupándome por esto. Well, the ironic thing is, is I was almost the only lawyer in the world who wanted to use uh, his legal training to help non-human animals, but, but not quite. In, in November of 1981, I learned that there were other lawyers in the United States who wanted, who wanted to hold a conference in New York City to talk about forming what became the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Bueno, ah, irónicamente en realidad era uno de los pocos abogados que estaba interesado en este caso. Pero después encontré otro grupo de abogados que justo en el año 1981 me ayudaron para eh, crear el, el Fondo de Defensa de los Animales. El Animal Legal Defense Fund, sorry. No, it's okay. Y actually we, we call ourselves Attorneys for Animal Rights. And we call ourselves Attorneys for Animal Rights for four or five years until we began to think that using the word animal rights was too radical for lawyers to use. Bueno, empezamos a trabajar con el eh, bueno, derecho de los animales hasta que por cuatro años, si no me equivoco, cuatro o cinco años, hasta que descubrimos que el término eh, derecho de los animales, derecho de los animales, no era tan, no, no era muy conocido. And so we, in 1985, or around then, we began calling ourselves the Animal Legal Defense Fund. And I was the president of the Animal Legal Defense Fund from 1985 until 1995. And so we young lawyers used to sit around as much as we could get together because we came from all over the United States. So we would get together uh, three, maybe four times a year and try to try to come up with ideas about ways in which we might be able to help non-human animals. And then slowly the whole the whole awfulness Of the of the status of non-human animals in law uh, began to to dawn on me as I as I slowly realized through my litigation, which I usually lost, that non-human animals were considered to be things in law, and when they were things in law, that meant that they were essentially invisible to the legal system, to the, to the civil law, to judges doing civil cases, 
and that because non-human animals were invisible, uh, they had they lacked almost um, uh, all protection. Y ahí fue cuando empecé a empezar a la parte fea de esto, de estudiar esto del derecho de los animales, porque me di cuenta que el, el, los animales son considerados cosas para la ley, y al ser considerados cosas son invisibles y se les niegan los derechos fundamentales. Eso lo, eh, lo descubrí a través de las litigaciones en el derecho normal, en el derecho común. So that, that went on for four or five years as I, as I began to, to realize the legal situation that, that non-human animals were in. And about 1985 now, 29 years ago, uh, I began to work with a man named David Faber, who, uh, who I'd met at that uh, conference in 1981. As, and indeed, those of us who met each other in 1981 are still friends and colleagues uh, now, 30-some years later, still scattered all over the United States. Bueno, y ahí fue cuando decidí comenzar a trabajar con esto eh, con un colega con el cual treinta eh, y pico de años después todavía seguimos trabajando juntos. And I don't remember the name of the Ah, David Taylor. I will tell him that he forgot. No. And and I began to, I, and so David Faber and I would sit down and he was in uh, Detroit. We would sit down and and uh, begin to think of what it is we could do. And in my own mind, I, I realized that this was a very serious problem that was going to take a long time to even begin to attack. Ahí los dos juntos sentados comenzamos a pensar en en este problema y nos dimos cuenta que iba a ser un problema de larga duración eh, al cual íbamos a tener que enfrentar. And so in 1985. I decided uh, that I that I would think of, and I worked with David Faber, that, that I would think of, of how we might be able to set out a strategy. And I figured that if everything went right, we'd be able to file the first cases in 30 years. Y fue en 1985, junto con David Faber, que comenzamos a pensar en una estrategia eh, de cómo tratar este tema. Pero, bueno, esto duró por unos 30 y largos años. Because there was only a handful of us lawyers who cared at, at, at that time. There were no courses being taught in, in any law schools in the United States. There were no books that had been written. Uh, there, were, uh, there were very few law review articles. There was almost nothing that had ever been written or talked about on the issue of, of whether a non-human animal could possibly have a legal right. Sí, porque nos dimos cuenta que éramos solo un puñado de abogados trabajando por eso, porque en aquel momento en Estados Unidos no había ni libros de texto, ni se enseñaban en la facultad, no había artículos en revistas, nada que ayudara en esta causa. So I began to go to my local law library uh, when when they used, when we used to use books, and I and I began to study why it is that humans have rights. How do humans get rights? what rights are, and I learned everything about the history of human rights that I could. I would take books out of the library and read them and put them back and leave them out about half an inch And then two years later, I come back, and the books are still there. So it was really just me who was reading those books. Yo sacaba los libros, le leía lo más que podía, por ahí quedaba solo un poquito de para leerlo, lo marcaba. Volvía dos años más tarde, y seguía la misma marca. O sea, que el único que leía era yo. And so after doing that for about five years, I thought, okay, I think I'm ready to to begin. And I thought we need to begin uh, having courses in which. Lawyers teach or become professors and teach animal rights at law schools. We needed law review articles were being written about the issues. We needed to uh, uh, to have uh, books that were being written that lawyers uh, and judges could understand. And th those are the first things we needed. Entre las cosas que bueno estuve trabajando con estos cinco años para lograr crear cursos, eh, cursos para que los, eh, los alumnos estudiaran, los profesores enseñaran sobre el derecho animal, para que hubiese libros y, bueno, y textos. Esto es una de las primeras cosas que se necesitaba. And so in 1990, the Vermont Law School, Vermont is a state in, in the United States, the Vermont Law School, out of nowhere, asked if I would teach a class in animal law. 
uh, there during the summertime. And I said I would, and I've been teaching it there every single summer uh, ever since. Ah, y fue en 1990 que la Escuela de Derecho de Vermont eh, me pidió que yo diera cátedra en Derecho Animal. Ahí comencé y ahí enseño cada eh, verano, cada curso de verano. ¿No? And, and then something important happened. Peter Singer came back to my life again. Uh, uh, Peter and I have become friends, and we, we, we've stayed friends for more than 30 years. And his book had begun really setting me off on, 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 the, on the course toward the, the, that I had, had, had been taking and had caused me to read um, dozens and dozens of books by philosophers about the moral rights of non-human animals. Bueno, y ahí fue cuando Peter Singer vuelve nuevamente a mi vida. Eh, su libro empieza a tener más efecto en mí y ahí yo empiezo también a leer docenas y docenas de libros sobre los derechos morales y éticos son filósofos, libros de filosofía and uh, in 1991 I think uh, Peter Singer and Paolo Cavalieri another an Italian philosopher uh, wrote a book called The Great Eight Project and also began The Great Eight Project and They asked David Faber and I if we would submit a chapter on the legal rights of non-human animals. En 1991 que él me pide que eh, haga un capítulo sobre los derechos humanos, de los derechos, derechos legales de los animales no humanos. Con otra persona, Pablo Cavalier. And so, if you get a copy of the book, The Great Ape Project and you open it to find my article, uh, you will not see it because it is not there. Because at the last moment, Peter and Paola kicked our article out. Ah, bueno, el libro se llama The Great Aid Project, es lo que me dije antes. Si ustedes abren el libro, no van a encontrar mi capítulo porque Peter y Pablo me pidieron que lo sacaran. Why? Why, my dad? <laughs> Well, the, the reason why is that they were philosophers, and they did not like the fact that we were we were analyzing it in legal terms, which might not be the same way that they would analyze it, and might even uh, not be as pure, philosophically pure, as they wanted. Ah, el motivo es que, o sea, como ellos eran filósofos, eh, veían que ellos analizaban no, eh, todo en términos legales y se perdía la esencia de lo, de lo filosófico, por eso. So our emails went back and forth, and we finally were given an ultimatum that we either had to change in certain ways and they would kick the article out, and we refused to do that and they kicked the article out. <laughs> A pesar de que no negamos, ellos lo mismo sacaron el artículo. I, I was pretty mad. <laughs> and so I went to a computer and looked at the legal at a legal research tool and I called up every American case that had been decided that was reported on, on the computer uh, since 1619 and I put the words Peter Singer in to see what came out. Entonces fui, me senté enfrente de la computadora y empecé a buscar la herramienta de investigación legal eh, para ver, bueno, y ahí eh, para que salieran diferentes artículos. Y ahí vi que en, eh, desde el año 1619 aparecían artículos y también apareció el nombre, salió el nombre de Peter Singer. Nothing came out. So I, I put the, the uh, name of another prominent American animal rights philosopher named Tom Reagan in to see what came out. And nothing came out uh, for, for Tom either. So that meant that no American court had ever said the words Peter Singer or Tom Reagan. Claro, nunca habían salido. Peter Singer nunca apareció. Cuando él puso Peter Singer no apareció nada. Puso el nombre de otro, Tom Reagan. Tampoco obtuvo resultados. Ninguno había presentado nada, ningún caso en la corte. No había caso con precedentes en la corte. So I put the word Aristotle in, and I found that maybe 10 times in, in, in 390 years an American court had ever said the word Aristotle. Aristotle. Aristotle, the philosopher. The philosopher. Yes. Cuando puse el nombre Aristóteles apare aparecía 10 veces en 390 años eh, con texto de él, publicaciones, publicaciones, pero artículos. That's when I realized that judges didn't care about philosophy. 
and that they didn't understand philosophy and they didn't value philosophy. And if I was going to persuade judges that a non-human animal should have a legal right, I needed to begin to persuade them in legal terms that they had been educated about, that they used every day, so that what I was doing would appear much less strange. Claro, ahí me di cuenta que los jueces no saben de la filosofía, no le prestan atención, no se interesan por la filosofía. Entonces me di cuenta que si quería luchar por el derecho de los animales no humanos, tenía que comenzar a hacerlo en términos legales. Y me dejé de leer libros sobre filosofía. Y el último año, Peter y yo hablamos en una conferencia de Yale, y nos dimos un keynote de address. And I knew Peter, and, and they asked me if I would ask him to come and give the keynote address. So I sent Peter an email saying, Eric Peter, would you come and give this keynote address at Yale? We lawyers couldn't care less what you have to say, but the other people might care. Uh, I... Keynote. Uh, keynote. Darle una dirección importante a esto, porque es algo que a los jueces les interesa. Quizás nosotros no lo entendemos, pero el resto sí entiende de qué estamos hablando. And uh, Peter has a sense of humor, and he agreed to come, and, and, and he did. But I still haven't read any philosophy you know, since 1991. What I began doing was trying to think in, in terms of how judges think. The whole purpose of of, of first David and David and my work, and then he dropped away, and then my work was how to make a legal argument that would result in non-human animals gaining legal personhood, which we define as the capacity to have a legal right. So what sort of arguments we would need to make? Bueno, eh, Peter Singer siguió leyendo libros de filosofía a pesar de que yo no lo hice. Yo me empecé a preocupar en lograr objetivos. ¿Qué hacer para que los jueces entendieran o para que los, eh, se, se preocuparan por eh, conseguir los derechos legales para los animales no humanos? Eh, para que estos sean considerados sujetos de derecho. ¿Qué, ca eh, qué capacidad deben tener para que ellos sean considerados sujetos de derecho? Y así empecé a escribir una serie de artículos de la ley. No sé si los argentinos tienen la ley de la ley. Empezaba a vivir una serie de artículos legales, eh, pero no sabes si los, eh, si los argentinos han leído o son. No, no, no. Sí, ok, bueno, lo explico. Sí, lo explicaré. Esa es la razón. Cada American. No, es ok. Cada <laughs> American Law School publica un a, a journal en el que. Uh, in which professors usually, but sometimes students, can submit articles to be published on almost any legal topic that, that they want. And some American law schools may have eight, eight or ten of them. So there's probably you know, four or five hundred law reviews that are published each year in, in the United States. Claro, la, la Facultad de Abogacía, la Escuela de Leyes de Estados Unidos, tiene periódicos en los cuales los alumnos pueden publicar artículos sobre temas legales específicos. Eh, generalmente entre 8 a 10 por año y ahora de haber alrededor de 500, 400 a 500 artículos publicados en, en Estados Unidos. So the whole purpose of publishing and thinking through the, these articles was so that lawyers and judges and law professors would begin to, to hear the, about, about the ideas why non-human animals should have rights before we ever went into court. Claro, el propósito de todos estos artículos era que tanto los jueces como los abogados como los estudiantes escucharan sobre este tema y se preocuparan antes de llegar eh, digamos, a presentar los casos de la justicia. After five or six years, I realized that nobody reads law Después de cinco o seis años me di cuenta de que nadie lee estos artículos, de que nadie los lee. So that's when I began thinking of publishing a, a trade book. Which, which uh, I found a publisher, and I, I took the articles that I had written in technical language and put them in language that I hoped an average, you know, educated person would be, would be able to understand. And that was my first book, Rattling the Cage Toward Legal Rights for Animals, which came out in the year 2000. Entonces me di cuenta que lo, más, eh, lo que tendría que hacer era comenzar a escribir un libro 
eh, siempre poniendo toda esta terminología legal a un nivel de que un, eh, una persona promedio, educada, lo pudiese entender. Y así fue como publiqué mi libro, el primer libro, Run in the Cage. And so to my surprise, it got a huge amount of attention in the United States and famous judges came out and wrote articles about it in law reviews. Uh, <laughs> Uh, lawyers came out, there were conferences at, at law schools, and it, it, it did exactly what I hoped it would do. It began to stimulate the debate about whether non-human animals should, uh, should be legal persons with legal rights. And then, almost at the exact same time, I was asked to teach the first class in animal rights at Harvard Law School. Y ahí me di cuenta de cuánta atención le prestaba el público. Eh, jueces famosos comenzaron a leer, incluso a publicar también artículos sobre este tema. Eh, y eso es lo que, no solo los jueces, sino abogados, estudiantes. Y eso es lo que yo quería, justamente, que se estimulara el debate sobre si los animales no humanos eh, no ser, tienen que ser considerados sujetos de derechos. And so, that plus the, plus the fact that simultaneously, Peter Singer was appointed a professor at Princeton, caused the, even more newspapers and even more even other sorts of media to take to pay attention and think that maybe something was happening in the field of animal rights jurisprudence or animal rights law, or for Peter, animal rights philosophy. <laughs> Eh, y ahí es como que empezamos a ver que algo se podría hacer sobre la jurisprudencia del derecho animal. And so when I was uh, speaking and on lecture tours and book tours and about Brown the Cage, I kept getting a question which was, well, where do you draw the line? And so I decided to write a second book called Drawing the Line, in which I explained how you could make a draw a rational line when you're trying to determine Uh, at least for some purposes, which non-human animals might at least be the first animals who should have legal personhood and legal rights. Bueno, y ahí fue donde, eh, después de tanto hablar y leer eh, sobre, de, bueno, sobre este primer libro, Rat in the Cage, surgió la pregunta de dónde eh, se establecen los límites. Entonces, a, a raíz de eso surge mi segundo eh, libro, eh, Drawing the Line, Drawing the Line. Eh, El segundo libro, el primer libro es del año 2000. El segundo libro, Drawing Line, sería marcando el límite. Fue como empezar a fijar los primeros eh, límites en relación como cuáles serían aquellos primeros animales que podrían comenzar a atravesar esa pared ¿sí? y comenzar a ser reconocidos como sujetos de derecho. A veces también él necesita And so those two books really, really contained the arguments that I intend to begin making. So now this is 2003, so I'm 18 years into my 30 year, my 30 year plan. Estos dos, estos dos libros justo contenían los argumentos legales que eran necesarios para presentar. Eh, esto surgió en el 2003 y bueno, lleva 18 años trabajando en esa. And then, when I wrote Brown in the Cage, I referred in about a page to a slave trial that had occurred in England in 1772, uh, which, and the, the slave's name was James Somerset, and he had used Uh, the common law writ of habeas corpus in order to achieve his freedom. Claro, cuando comencé a escribir este libro, eh, me refería a un caso particular de esclavitud en el año 1772, que es de un esclavo negro llamado James Somerset, quien recurrió a la justicia por el medio, por el medio del periodo del habeas corpus. And so I began to look more deeply into the idea of using a common law writ of habeas corpus in order to file that on behalf of a non-human animal. Y ahí fue cuando empecé a ver más detalladamente que podía llegar a usar el recurso del habeas corpus para luchar por los derechos de los animales no humanos, que era un medio para luchar por los derechos de los animales no humanos. Now the common law and the civil law are different. 
el, common law, el sistema del common law es diferente del derecho civil. So the civil law primarily is composed of statutes that are, which are passed by parliament or administrative rules of, of some kind, but that's not what the common law is primarily, well, it, it's not completely uh, in private. Eh, el derecho civil se basa en estatutos que se pasan a través del parlamento o de los ministerios, pero el, el common law actúa de manera diferente. So in, in the United States and in England, in fact, in every country in which the judges speak English, uh, the, the common law is used, and judges are, are much more powerful than common law, in common law courts. They can make decisions that that a, a, a country like Argentina would automatically be made only by parliament. But in, in a common law country, judges uh, have, have these wide powers. In the United Unidos and in Inglaterra, where los jueces hablan inglés, el, el sistema del common law se usa y esto los hace más eh, poderosos a los jueces porque eh, ellos son los que toman las decisiones. A diferencia de, por ejemplo, el sistema en Argentina donde, donde todo se da a través del Parlamento. So, common law judges actually make the law. No, los jueces del common law son los que en verdad crean la ley. So do our, our congresses and parliaments. They also make law and their law will trump what a common law judge does. But in the areas in which a legislature has not specifically legislated, the judges can then make the law. Bueno, además de que ellos hacen la, la ley en, en otros lugares donde la legislación no ha sido totalmente específica, ellos tienen el poder de crear la ley. And so there are, there are just many areas in which common law judges have made the law for centuries. So, uh, what is a contract? What is a breach of contract? And what is a tort? Uh, the, these are all, all common law concepts, and amongst them is the idea of habeas corpus. Bien, eh, entonces ellos, el, el, el sistema de common law trabaja en muchas áreas, por ejemplo, que es el contrato, un incumplimiento o ruptura del contrato. Entre esos, eh, está también, entre esos métodos, está también el sistema del de, recurso de la vez cuando. And so, habeas corpus, like, roughly means produced body. And it, in, in uh, English-speaking countries, it, it's also known as the Great Writ. It's seen as, as perhaps the most important uh, writ that can go in front, in front of a court, so that anyone who is being imprisoned has the right to go in front of the judge on a writ of habeas corpus and demand that the judge order the, person, the uh, jailer, the person who's keeping him in prison, to, to bring the body of the prisoner into court and give a legally sufficient explanation for holding entonces, el, el recurso del habeas corpus es uno de los recursos más importantes por los cuales se puede traer a una persona, un sujeto, delante de la corte. Y el juez tiene, eh, digamos, el derecho o tiene el poder de preguntarle al, al mantiene a la persona prisionera que presente y que dé las razones legales por las cuales esa persona está mantenida prisionera. And that brought me back to James Somerset. <coughs> Y ahí volvemos al caso de James Somerset, el esclavo. So James Somerset was a black slave who was kidnapped when he was eight years old from West Africa. He survived the Middle Passage and was sold uh, in um, Virginia to a man named, to a Scottish man named Charles Stewart. Eh, James Somerset eh, fue un esclavo negro que fue eh, capturado en Sudáfrica y fue vendido a un hombre escocés llamado Charles Stewart. And this was in the, uh, the mid-1740s. And James Somerset uh, then began to travel all through the, the American colonies with Charles Stewart, who began to rise in the ranks of the North American British Customs Service. Esto sucedió a mediados de los 1740. Y de ahí en más, James Somerset comenzó a viajar a través de Estados Unidos e Inglaterra con eh, Charles Stewart. Eh, quien estaba en el sistema de la aduana. Charles Stewart was working with. Ah, sí, sí, en Por eso viajaba de Estados Unidos a Inglaterra. And so uh, he ended up in, in, in the of the, of the 1760s living with um, Charles Stewart in Boston, which at that time was where a lot of revolutionary 
you know, fervor was being generated, and he almost certainly uh, ran into, knew John Adams or heard of John Adams or John Hancock or some of the other American American uh, revolutionaries. Y termina, uh, los 60 viviendo con Charles Stewart en Boston, justo en pleno movimiento de la revolución eh, con esta persona, con John Adams, quien era un revolucionario americano. And so uh, Charles Stewart then wanted to go to London. He moved to London and, and he took James Somerset with him. And James Somerset, after about a year in London, decided that he wanted to escape. And so one day, he had some kind of a confrontation about with uh, Charles Stewart, and he disappeared. <laughs> bueno, Charles Stewart eh, se lleva a James Somerset a Inglaterra con él, eh, y ahí es donde James Somerset decide que él quiere escaparse. Eh, tiene una fuerte confrontación, una fuerte pelea con eh, Charles Stewart, y él decide que quiere desaparecer. <laughs> Desaparece. <laughs> so at that time, London was the largest city in the world had over a million population, and it was built really deep into the ground and spread out, and, and uh, it was not easy to find somebody. So Charles Stewart was so angry as whatever went on, and I was never able to find out exactly what was said between Charles Stewart and uh, James Somerset, but what happened, uh, I angered Charles Stewart so much that he hired slave catchers to track James Somerset down. Bueno, era un territorio tan grande que era imposible encontrar a alguien. Por ende, le cuesta mucho a Charles Stewart encontrar a James Somerset. Se enoja tanto que eh, contrata a, a buscadores de esclavos eh, para que logren encontrarlo. And so after 73 days, they found, uh, they found James Somerset. And they didn't bring him back to Charles Stewart. Charles Stewart had ordered them to bring him to a ship called the Anna Mary that was anchored in London Harbor. And their work was to sail him to Jamaica, where he was to be sold in the slave markets. And then he would spend the, the, the rest of his life, which would be three to five years, harvesting sugar cane in Jamaica. Bueno, luego de 73 días de búsqueda, finalmente lo encuentran, lo prisionan, lo encadenan, lo meten en un barco que es llamado el Anna Mary, Anna y María, que en el puerto de Londres, que iba directo a Jamaica, donde James Somerset iba a ser, eh, iba a ser en el mercado de los esclavos, Someone, we don't know who, I was never able to find out who, but someone then brought a writ of habeas corpus before Lord Mansfield, who was the Chief Justice of the Court of King's Bank in London, and one of the most powerful uh, men in England at the time. Alguien, no se sabe quién, yo hasta el momento no sé quién fue, eh, presentó el recurso de habeas corpus frente a eh, Lord Marshall, que era uno de los jueces más poderosos de Londres, uno de los jueces de la inglesa más poderosos de Londres. Now, this wasn't the first time that Lord Mansfield had a case involving a slave. Uh, a man named Granville Sharp, who was sometimes referred to as the first abolitionist, had been involved in a case involving a slave. That was so, and, and what had happened to him was the same thing that happened to me when I read Peter Singer's book in 1980. All of a sudden, I realized that non-human animals were being treated terribly, and the incident that 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 uh, Granville Sharp was involved in opened his eyes to the fact that there were slaves in England and they weren't being treated very well. Bueno, para Lord Mansfield este esto fue sorprendente porque era la primera vez que él escuchaba de un caso de esclavitud en Inglaterra. Le pasó lo mismo que me pasó a mí cuando leí el libro de Peter Singer, que no podía creer que los animales fueran tratados de esa forma. Él no podía creer que en Inglaterra actualmente tuviera esclavos, que la esclavitud existiera. And so, about eight years before, uh, um, Granville Sharp had decided that slavery was, was anti-Christian and abomination, and that and that it was going to be ended in England, and Lord Mansfield was going to do it. Uh, though he did not communicate this to Lord Mansfield. Lord Mansfield, sin saber que ocho años antes, eh, Abraham. Charles. Who was the, first, the person who ate me years before? Oh, um, um, Randall Sharp. Yeah. Randall Sharp. Randall Sharp. Yes. Eh, declaró que la eh, esclavitud era anticristiana, era abominable, sin saber Lord Mansfield, eh, Lord Mansfield eh, ocho años después, termina con ella. Que no, and, no lo sabía. And so he, uh, Randall Sharp had been responsible for seeing that a number of cases involving slaves 
had gone in front of Lord Mansfield in the previous eight years, which had begun irritating Lord Mansfield. Este hombre fue responsable de que hubiera muchos casos que, eh, digamos, trataban con la esclavitud se presentaran ante Lord Mansfield. And so, on the very date, on the, on, on the morning of the day that someone brought a writ of habeas corpus on behalf of, of, of James Somerset, Lord Mansfield had got had in a bad mood from the last case involving a slave out of his court. En la mañana del día que alguien le presentó el recurso de habeas corpus a Lord Mansfield, estaba de tan mal humor que decidió que ese era el último caso de esclavitud que estaría en la corte. Estaba cansado de que le mandaran tanto, tantos casos a él. So before lunch, Lord Mansfield had finally gotten the last slave case out of his court. After lunch, people come in claiming that uh, seeking a writ of habeas corpus on behalf of another slave, James Somerset who is chained to the deck of the Anne and Mary, and they want that writ of habeas corpus now, before the ship sets sail. Después del almuerzo, alguien le trae el recurso de habeas corpus de este esclavo, James Somerset, quien iba a ser enviado a Jamaica, esclavo en un barco, y le piden que, bueno, que lo resuelva. This is really the, the greatness, one of the manifestations of the greatness of Lord Mansfield. I think was the greatest judge ever to speak English. In that, he, he had he had to make a decision. Should he issue a writ of habeas corpus? Now it's not that easy of a decision because a writ of habeas corpus applies only to persons. It does not apply to things in the law. So the, so Lord Mansfield could have taken the easy way out and said, James Somerset is a slave. He's property. He's a thing, and I'm not going to issue a writ of habeas corpus. Or he could have done what they asked him to do, which is uh, assume Lord Mansfield without deciding right now that James Somerset could be a legal person. Let us make the argument to you and let you decide whether indeed he is a legal person or he's a legal thing. Boy. <laughs> is that too much? He was a legal person. I was trying to talk about it. Because I started getting excited. Yes. <laughs> 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 Bueno, en este momento, bueno, eh, todo esto, eh, todo este tema con respecto a la esclavitud y que él la terminó, demuestra la grandeza de Lord Mansfield. Eh, en ese momento él tenía que tomar una decisión. La decisión era si él aceptaba el recurso de habeas corpus. No era algo fácil porque el recurso de habeas corpus estaba pensado solo para personas, eh, personas seres humanos, digamos, y en este caso, al ser un esclavo, el esclavo era considerado una cosa sin derechos. Entonces, él estaba entre eh, dos opciones, eh, otorgar el derecho de, de, de un juicio de habeas corpus a, al esclavo y que él se volviera una, un sujeto de derechos o simplemente no tomarlo. Um, digamos, eh, eh, lo que él comenta es que Lord Mansfield, que además considera que fue uno de los mejores jueces que existió en la historia de, de la humanidad, no de habla inglesa, Tuvo esta opción de rechazar el habeas corpus directamente, ¿por qué? Porque el esclavo era considerado una cosa, entonces el habeas corpus no es aplicable a las cosas, sino que a las personas. O tomar la otra opción, que fue una opción arriesgada y no, que nadie, nadie había tomado en ese momento, que fue de asumir que podría llegar a ser una persona, el esclavo, y permitirles al abogado argumentar y una vez que argumentara que decidieran o no si le otorgaba el, luego el recurso de, 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 de la vez corta, perdón eh, y optó por esa segunda opción ¿sí? ¿qué es lo que él les puedo comentar? es lo que ellos están trabajando en su proyecto de derechos humanos que quisiera que un juez cuando vean un animal ¿no? en, un, en un caso eh, asuma que ese animal puede llegar a tener derechos y que les permitan a los abogados argumentar a favor en vez de rechazarles antes de mano, no decir, no, el animal es una cosa, no te escucho. ¿Sí? Un poco lo que les puedo contar. Sorry. No, thank you. So, one of the reasons that I, that, that I tell the story, and I get so excited right around this area, is I knew that that, that time would be very, very critical. And indeed, this is exactly the position I found myself in on December 2nd, 2013, when I went in front of the judge asking that Tommy, the chimpanzee, be, that, that ask that he issue a writ of habeas corpus on behalf of Tommy, the chimpanzee. 
Por eso traje a colación este ejemplo, eh, porque es una situación, la razón es porque es una situación crítica y es de, es, yo estuve en la misma posición que estuvo, eh, en cierto modo, Lord Mansfield en el 2 de diciembre del 2013, cuando presenté el caso eh, del chimpancé Tommy que está mantenido en cautiverio en, en Nueva York y presenté el recurso de, el, el recurso de habeas corpus. So I was very aware that 241 years before I was standing up in front of the court asking that Tommy the chimpanzee be the, be the object of a writ of habeas corpus on from the judge, that Lord Mansfield had, had to confront the exact same problem with respect to uh, James <coughs> Somerset, the black slave. Eh, tomé conciencia en ese momento que 241 años atrás los más estuvo en la misma situación que estuve yo pidiendo el recurso de haber corpus a un chimpancé Tommy So Lord Mansfield then issued the writ of habeas corpus and assumed that, that uh, James Somerset might be a legal person even though he didn't say that he was but he said I'm going to hear arguments <coughs> Uh, about it, and so he did. He issued the writ of habeas corpus. James Somerset was taken off of the ship and brought before him, and basically put out on bail. Bien. Entonces, en aquel momento, Lord Mansfield eh, tomó la decisión de aceptar el recurso de habeas corpus y logró pensar que James Somerset podía llegar a ser considerado sujeto de derecho. Entonces, decidió escuchar los argumentos que había hicieron que eh, a James Somerset se lo sacara del barco donde iba prisionero, se lo presentara ante la corte y se hablara de, digamos, para que presentaran esos argumentos. Now, the reason I was so interested in this, in the James Somerset case, is it involved the, us invoking the common law writ of habeas corpus, which was the law of habeas corpus as made by judges, and not a statute, not a habeas corpus statute. Por eso, en la razón por la cual yo estoy tan interesado en el caso de James Somerset es porque quiero invocar al, al, al corpus del, del sistema del common law, no que todo sea, que todo sea digamos, solucionado y tratado por los jueces, no por la constitución del parlamento. So, Lord Mansfield could, could operate within a wide legal range, and most importantly, I was not asking, not I, I'm sorry, I wasn't there. <laughs> I've studied it so much, sometimes I think I was there. <laughs> When I was writing a book about this, and I did indeed write a book about this called Though the Heavens May Fall, uh, one of the things I did was to write to, uh, to the ninth Lord Mansfield in England and asked for, for if he had any kind of information. And one day I got an envelope back, and I, it was months after I'd done it, I'd forgotten I'd written to him. And I opened it up and it said, Dear Attorney Wise, Lord Mansfield asked me to tell you this. And I, I thought, he, he's telling me things. But I, I realized it was not the first Lord Mansfield telling me this thing. It was the ninth Lord Mansfield telling me this thing. The ninth? The ninth. Ah, entonces, bueno, un día cuando eh, decidí escribir en mi tercer libro, eh, Dow Heaven's May Fall, bueno, yo mandé un escrito al noveno Lord Mansfield que existía y me olvidé. Hasta que un día recibí un sobre que decía, tía, eh, querido abogado, bueno, estimado abogado, eh, Steven, y dije, oh, Lord Mansfield, pero era el noveno Lord Mansfield. No, el primero. No, pensé que era el primero. So, There, that began this extraordinary set of court hearings that lasted on and off from November 1771 until June 22nd of 1772, when Lord Mansfield, uh, on behalf of all the judges of the Court of King's Bench, although he ignored all the rest of them and did what he wanted anyway, and they all went along, uh, until he issued his decision as to as to whether uh, whether. Um, James Somerset would, would be a slave or would be free, and whether he issued a writ of habeas corpus. Tomó eh, un largo seis meses de eh, con los jueces, perdón, porque me perdí en una parte. Desde noviembre de 1771 hasta junio de 1772 duraron seis meses de idas y vueltas con eh, consultando, sí, con todos los jueces. Eh, James Somerset continuaría siendo un esclavo o se lo dejaría libre. 
And the hearing right before, the June 22nd, occurred in, in May of 1772. And Lord Mansfield was trying to get the two parties to settle the case so he didn't have to decide it. And by then, all the city of London, the country of England, had really split into camps. And, and everyone understood that this was going to be a major test case as to whether you could be a slave in England. Entonces, en mayo de 1772, eh, Lord Mansfield trajo a las dos partes juntas y, eh, porque ya necesitaba tomar una decisión. En ese momento, eh, they, they had to make a decision, and at that moment, uh, ah, la, la, claro, la gente en Inglaterra tomaba distintas posiciones. And so the, the, the lawyers who were now the greatest lawyers in England, they were on both sides. Uh, and nobody would settle the case. And so Lord Mansfield then like threw up his arms and said, Well then let justice be done, though the heavens may fall. And that's where I got the name of my book. Ah, en ese momento los abogados, que serían los abogados más importantes hoy en día, también tomaron dos bandos, dos partes. Y Lord Mansfield eh, les tuvo que decir, bueno, tenemos que llegar a una decisión y por eso me dio eh, The Heavens May Fall, que el cielo se nos caiga. Tenían que llegar a una decisión final. Dijo esa frase, por eso el nombre, eh, that's why the name of your third book, due to that phrase. Yes, The Heavens May Fall. The Heavens May Fall. And so, in, uh, on June 22, 1772, Lord Mansfield stated orally from the bench a very short opinion, lasted about two minutes, and the key sentence in it was that slavery was so odious. That is a very bad thing. So slavery was so odious that the common law would not support it. Y fue en junio, el 22 de junio de 1772, cuando él se levanta de su banco y decide que la esclavitud es tan detestable que el sistema del common law no la iba a aceptar. Nunca. And indeed, the way, that's when I, I began my book with James Somerset running out of the courthouse down the street and pounding on Granville Sharp's door, which I know happened because I, I read his diary. And, and, Lord, and uh, Granville Sharp saying uh, uh, it, it's over, you know, in, in the struggle between Granville Sharp and Lord Mansfield, for basically, Granville Sharp won, and there's no more slavery. Y bueno, fue ese eh, el momento cuando yo comencé mi libro, eh, el momento en que James Somerset sale eh, siendo un hombre libre. I even tried to find out what happened at a, uh, a, a dinner. There was a dinner in London 200 years after this occurred, uh, at which all the famous, the, the judges, the Lord Mayor, they all had this dinner, and deep in the bowels of a Harvard, of a Harvard library, I found the guest list and where everybody sat. Ah, eh, había eh, 200 años, después hubo una, una cena en la cual ocurrían todos los jueces importantes y en una biblioteca que yo siempre consultaba encontré donde, porque esto ocurría creo que en un lugar que ahora es una biblioteca y ahí encontré las casillas donde los jueces estuvieron sentados, donde se reunían. So I, I saw that, that Lord Wilberforce, who was a descendant of Uh, Wilberforce, who was the other great abolitionist in England in the 18th and 19th century, I saw where he'd sat and that he'd been there, and I sent him a letter asking him if, if uh, you know, 33 years later, if he could tell me what, what was going on and what he talked about. Y ahí encontré a Lord eh, something, <laughs> quien era un gran evolucionista. Lord Wilberforce. Wilberforce, quien era un gran evolucionista del siglo XVIII. So his great 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 grandson was a very famous abolitionist in the 19th century, and Lord Wilberforce also wrote me back, and he said that he was 96 years old and he couldn't remember what happened yesterday. <laughs> Tatara Tatara Nieto, entonces, ah, él se contactó con el Tatara Tatara Nieto de Lord eh, Rainfall. Claro, era abolicionista y dice que él no podía acordarse qué pasó en ese momento porque solo tenía nueve, nine. 
He was 90. So that was the end of the Somerset case. I had all the information I, I could get. And the most important thing for our case was that it essentially ended slavery in England based on the judge's use of the common law of habeas corpus and not a statute. And I wrote, though the heavens may fall, so you could read it as a story about how slavery ended in England, but you could also read it as a metaphor and, and, and really as a blueprint for what, the, what I intended the non-human rights to do uh, sometime in the next uh, 12 years. <laughs> y bueno, ustedes, cuando yo escribí este libro, The Heavens May Fall, eh, lo cual ustedes pueden, cual pueden leer simplemente como una historia, como un cuento, o para entender eh, el proyecto que es, digamos, el proyecto en el que él se basa, porque este caso fue clave para la decisión de él del de, de, de proyecto del recurso de los derechos no humanos. So up until about 2007, which is now 22 years after I decided that uh, that we're going to begin the process of getting legal rights for non-human animals in the United States, at least. Uh, I, I decided I, I was finished writing and finished thinking about, you know, theorizing about it, and the time had come to begin working on the actual cases. In the year 2007, which was when he created the Project of Human Rights, is when he decides that he no va a escribir más, pero sino que va a empezar a tomar acción, que es el momento de empezar a tomar acción y presentar casos. So I began to bring other people in, into the non-human rights project. I would, I teach many places, and I would see who, who my smartest students were, and I'd ask if they would come work with me, volunteer to work with the non-human rights project. Y es ahí cuando junto a muchas personas de diferentes lugares, yo ense, enseño en diferentes lugares y a mis estudiantes más inteligentes o más destacados los llamé para que trabajaran conmigo como voluntarios en este proyecto.